Good morning. It is February 7th. We are one week away from Valentine's Day. Whoa, already? Remember, remember being a kid and it felt like multiple years between Christmas and Valentine's Day? <laughs> <laughs> now it's like you blink and, oh, where'd that time go? Well, we're going to sing a song about uh, God and, and his love and his plan um, and how we uh, can celebrate and join the celebration that's been going on for generations. Um, and and it's, it's like an echo. We are echoing the celebration that, that has been happening for, for thousands of years of what God has done and, and the, uh, the redemption, the salvation, the assurance that we have um, of his goodness and his good plan for us. So let's stand and uh, worship God. Yeah. 
are spring to life, we will sing, we will dance, till the earth echoes the heavens, sing His grace, till we see the other side. Good morning. Welcome to the Minnehaha Church of Christ this morning. We are so glad you're here. If you're watching online, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, or Vimeo, we're glad you're tuning in. We pray that our services today will be a blessing to you. Today is the Lord. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and uh, that's a reason to rejoice. That's a reason to be glad. You know, God has given us Christians so many reasons to be joyful. Today we're going to talk about laughing with God, and God has given us laughter, and he's given us a reason to celebrate, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to celebrate uh, all the wonderful blessings that we have in Christ. Today is Sunday, February 7th, 2021, and uh, one of the blessings that I want to uh, make sure you're aware of is Um, some of the technological blessings we have. Uh, We have a website. We'd love for you to check that out, minihahachurch.org. There are some great resources on there that will be a blessing to you. You can download our church bulletin, and there's some great uh, information in there. Uh, There's a great article on the back of the bulletin today about uh, a missionary in India. John Gabriel's been doing work there in India very successfully, and God has blessed that work, and there's a report in there about what's taking place in India. And you can download our Sunday school lesson and our sermon notes. There's a, uh, a link there for online giving, as well as many other great resources that will be a blessing to you. If you have a smartphone or a tablet and you've not yet done so, please download the church app. There's some great resources through the Minnehaha Church of Christ app and uh, ways that you can stay in touch with us and uh, be blessed by uh, the resources that um, Sam Judd has been faithful in putting on that app. Uh, I'm just so thankful for all our tech guys, uh, Dave Kubo and Jordan Davina and Sam Judd and also Charles Daly's helped out a lot with uh, the, the tech stuff that we do here. And that's, that's something we desperately need in uh, the crazy times we're living in right now. Uh, we need to take advantage of every tool and uh, opportunity God gives for us to stay connected, to encourage one another, and to minister to people throughout the world. Well, I want to thank you for your generous support of the ministries of this church. Uh, that has been a tremendous blessing to us. It's enabled us to reach out and help people in need and share the gospel with people who need Jesus. And remember that your giving is an act of worship. It is pleasing to the eyes of God. And uh, that's one of the ways that we can express our gratitude for all that he's given to us. And uh, again, there's opportunities to give uh, here if you come to church person in person, but also through our online resources, there's ways that you can give to the ministries of this church. And we thank you for that. At this time, let's continue in our worship as we go to God in a word of prayer as we continue to sing songs of praise, celebrating the great blessings we have in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice and we celebrate and we are glad. We laugh together with you because of all the blessings you've given to us through Jesus Christ. God, we pray that our time of worship would be a blessing to you as you have been a tremendous blessing to us. We pray that our time of worship would bring a smile to your face, 
and joy to your heart. And God, we pray that you would lift our spirits. Uh, God, we know that there are many people today, especially uh, this year, who are suffering, who are going through difficult times, who are uh, struggling with fear and anxiety. And we pray that our time today, worshiping you, would lift their spirits and encourage their hearts. God, we know that uh, you've given us laughter, you've given us joy, you've given us every reason to rejoice and celebrate. And so we pray that you'd help us to do that today. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray this. Amen. So next we have uh, the new song for this month, uh, for February. Uh, the title of the song is First Love, and it comes from this Revelation passage, uh, of course. Anytime you hear the word first love, this is the first passage that comes to mind. And it's this, this letter from, from Jesus to this particular congregation that um, has strayed away. And, and so the... the uh, the attitude in, in the letter is, is very much one of, um, of discipline, of, of uh, do better. Um, uh, and so a lot of the songs that come from this, this passage are songs of repentance and, and confession and, and turning back to God and, and turning back to the first love. Um, uh, but Carrie Job uh, wrote this song... Um, as, as a love letter instead of, of this, this big confession and repentance um, because of, of what they are being called to and what the consequences are if they don't. They are called to return to their first love. That's what God wants from them is that, that relationship of love. And the consequences, if they don't, is that their lampstand will be removed. And what that means is the Holy Spirit will be removed from that congregation. Um, and that is God's presence, God working with them in a relationship of, of, of love and of um, uh, reliance and, and trust and, and working together. Um, and so both sides of it, the purpose is love and uh, that relationship um, even more than it is a disciplinary thing. And so um, she took that love letter aspect of it and wrote this song as, as a, a different kind of response from what you typically get from this song. And so it's this, this declaration in the chorus, you are still my first love, you are the only one. Um, and, and how sometimes this world is, is so distracting and, and, and just barrages us with, with all these things that, that are trying to take God's place as first in our heart. Um, and sometimes it can even be successful in making it feel uh, weird to keep God as first in our heart. Um, uh, but that chorus resolves... Um, back to that that uh, that one chord musically it, it resolves back to that that the chord that the key is in um, after that moment in the chorus every time because no matter how weird the world makes it feel God will always um, come through and and uh, bring the assurance that that our love is placed uh, where it belongs on him
I hear your voice, I see your face You're still my first love You're still my only one You're still my first love You're Just for you and me Break the bread and pour the wine Perfect union Nothing in between I am yours and you are mine You're still my first love
I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so
our time at the Lord's table as a time to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. The bread that we eat represents the body of Christ that was nailed to the cross for us. And the juice that we drink represents the blood that he shed for our forgiveness. And so this is a picture of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And of course, the gospel message is good news. It's a a major theme throughout the entire Bible. Every book of the Bible shows us the message of the gospel in some way. Even the more obscure books that we hardly ever read or, or learn about, such as the book of Nahum. Nahum was one of the minor prophets, and it's primarily a book of judgment against the empire of Assyria. In the Old Testament, back in 722 B.C., Assyria came in to the northern kingdom of Israel and completely destroyed the nation, taking thousands of God's people into captivity. And then a few years later, Assyria moved into the southern kingdom of Judah, destroyed 46 fortified cities of Judah, took hundreds captive, and, and came to Jerusalem, surrounded the city. And uh, in one, one night, it was during the, the reign of Hezekiah, in one night God sent a destroying angel throughout the camp of the Assyrians and destroyed 185,000 soldiers. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, packed up and went home and never came back to Judah again. <laughs> Well, the book of Nahum is written before that event, but it is a book about God's justice coming upon this violent empire of Assyria. But it's also a book that gives us a glimpse of the gospel. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, the prophet says this, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Nahum wanted to encourage the people of Judah to put their trust in the Lord, to seek him as a refuge in a time of trouble, and to remember that the Lord cares for those who trust in him. Uh, That's really the, the message that we are reminded of when we take the Lord's Supper. And it's a message we need, especially in times like these, when we are suffering through times of trouble. We need to know that the Lord is a refuge for us and that he cares for those who trust in him. Nahum gives Judah even more hope in verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace, Celebrate your festivals, O Judah. Fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. The empire of Assyria had been oppressing God's people for over a hundred years. But the book of Nahum reveals God's justice and judgment coming upon those wicked invaders. And as a result, Judah would be able to worship God in peace and security. They'd be able to celebrate their festivals without any worry of wicked invaders. Are you living in fear? A lot of people today are living in fear. And like the book of Nahum, the Lord's Supper reminds us that we don't have to live in fear. The Lord's Supper reminds us that the Lord is good. He is a refuge in times of trouble and that he cares for those who trust in him. Just as the Lord saved Judah from the Assyrians, Jesus saves us from our enemies, the enemies of death and sin. And just as Nahum told people in in Judah to trust in the Lord, seek him as their refuge. So 
the Lord's Supper tells us to trust in the Lord and seek Jesus as our refuge. The word gospel means good news. Nahum says, look, on the mountains there, the feet of one who proclaims good news, who announces peace. And that's what the Lord's Supper does for us. It draws our attention to the feet of someone on Mount Zion proclaiming peace. It's the feet of Jesus. The feet pierced and nailed to the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he was proclaiming peace for us. He was proclaiming victory over the enemies that have tormented us and oppressed us. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he declared his victory over death and sin. So when we take the Lord's Supper, let's remember this great proclamation of good news from Jesus there at the cross, announcing peace, announcing salvation, and announcing victory over our enemies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today and as we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are so thankful for the great sacrifice Jesus was willing to go through in order to proclaim peace, in order to make an opportunity, a way for us to have salvation, in order to give us the assurance of victory over our enemies. Thank you that because of his sacrifice, we not only have forgiveness of sins, but we have freedom from sin and the hope of eternal life. God, we thank you and, and we pray that this time of meditation and communion would inspire us, motivate us, and encourage us to live for you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Has God ever made you laugh? Has God ever brought laughter into your life? The name Isaac means he laughs. And when Isaac was born in Genesis chapter 21, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. Laughter, I believe, is a gift from God. I'm convinced that God has a sense of humor. I mean, just look at, look at some of the things he's created. Look at the giraffe with his long, stretched out neck sticking up above the highest branches on the tree. Look at the hippopotamus with her mouth wide open, almost 180 degrees. And, uh, you know, some of the other animals God has created, like the ostrich, this big flightless bird with her head stuck in the sand. Awkward. And uh, what about the duckbill platypus? He's this, this mammal that lays eggs with uh, the mouth of a duck and webbed feet and fur. It's almost like God got through creating all the animals and had a bunch of spare parts left over. What do I do with this? I got an idea. I'll make a duckbill platypus. God has a sense of humor, and I think he wants us to experience and enjoy laughter. I mentioned last week that God created us with the ability to experience a full range of a variety of human emotions, including fear. Last, last week we talked a little bit about fear, but I am thankful that God has given us laughter and that he has a sense of humor and he wants us to enjoy joy. Laughter is a gift from God that we need to experience and enjoy. But you know, I think as we get older, sometimes we get more serious and cynical about life and sometimes we miss out on a lot of the joy god wants us to experience uh, sometimes we forget how to laugh before my mom passed away she gave me a, a thumb drive with a lot of her writings and memories of her journey through life and uh, by the way, that's a good idea. <laughs> Write down, record some of your memories, some of the events and experiences that God has used to shape your heart and develop your faith. Let future generations experience and read and understand and learn from your journey through life. I've been reading some of my mom's writings and this week I found a treasure that goes very well with my sermon today. She begins with Psalm 30, verses 11 through 12. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. And then she writes this. When our son Michael was four years old, that's me, I picked him up from preschool one day. My mind was occupied with many things, and I responded to his chatter with absent-minded murmurs. After a while, he paused and said, I'm afraid I'm talking too much. He had my attention immediately, and I laughed. He laughed, too and said, I'm glad to hear that laughing. What a great gift the Creator has given to be a part of our being. Joy wells up within us and finds a voice that will not be silent. I could look up the scientific explanation of laughter, but that still would not explain the mystery of it. Laughter is healing, it's relaxing, it connects our humanity. My little son was feeling alone because I wasn't there. But when I laughed, he knew everything was all right. Because laughter is the shortest distance between two people. The psalmist gives praise to God for this gift, and so do I. 
I would have to agree with my mother on this one. Laughter is a gift from God. However, there are many different kinds of laughter. Not all laughter is good laughter, and we'll learn that in Genesis chapter 21. Uh, Before we read that passage, let's go to God in a word of prayer, and let's ask God to speak to us through his word this morning. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for joy. We thank you for celebration and rejoicing and the gift of laughter. God, you have given us so many blessings in life that bring joy to our hearts. And God, included in those blessings is your word. God, as we come to your word, as we listen to you speaking to us, I pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law, things that will bring us joy, rejoicing, and laughter. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and draw us close to you. I pray that through our time in your word today that you would accomplish what you want to achieve in our lives, shape our hearts, and develop our faith. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Genesis chapter 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham was mocking. That word mocking has the same root as the word Isaac. It's another form of laughing, but it's intensified and it's a negative kind of laughing. It's the laughing of a bully. It's scoffing and mocking and teasing. Not a good kind of laughter. She said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. As she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. Remember the word Ishmael. The name Ishmael means God hears. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. 
Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me and the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness I have shown to you. We learned last week that Abraham lied to Abimelech. And it got Abimelech into big trouble. So now Abimelech wants to establish a peace treaty with Abraham so that doesn't happen again. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba because the two men swore an oath there. Beersheba is made up of two words. One, beer means the well, and Sheba can mean two different things. It can mean seven, and it can also mean oath. So Abraham kind of sets this up as a play on words. Seven lambs represents the oath that Abimelech and Abraham would make there at that well, Beersheba. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted the tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. El Olam is one of the names of God in the Old Testament, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. This is the word of the Lord. There's a lot in this chapter. This chapter contains three major events in the life of Abraham. It talks about the birth of Isaac and the sending away of Hagar and Ishmael. And it talks about this peace treaty, this covenant that Abraham makes with Abimelech. However, the birth of Isaac is the continuation of the redemptive plan of God that he established back in Genesis chapter 3 when he gave the prophecy of the Messiah, how uh, this seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. You see, it would be through Isaac that this fulfillment of the coming Messiah would take place. It would be a descendant of Isaac. Isaac would be the son of the promise through whom God's plan of redemption would be fulfilled. So we're going to focus in on the birth of Isaac today, the first seven verses of this chapter, and how it applies to us. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 21? And the first way we should respond is we need to listen to God's promises The promises of God are powerful. They are life-changing. They give us hope and encouragement, especially in difficult times such as the times we're living in today. We need to listen to God's promises. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. At this point, Sarah is 90 years old. She had been barren her entire life. She was unable to have children, and she tried for decades to give Abraham, her husband, a child, but she was never able to conceive. And she was so desperate to have a child that in chapter 16, she even came up with this plan for Abraham, her husband, to sleep with Hagar, her maidservant. That's how Ishmael came into the family. In chapter 18, when she heard God's promise that it was specifically about her, that through Sarah, Abraham would become a father, she laughed at the idea. She didn't think it was possible. She couldn't believe that she could ever have a child. But God reminded her and Abraham that nothing is impossible with God. 
And this verse here in chapter 21 says that the Lord was gracious to Sarah. And he was, even though Sarah had lost hope, even though she told Abraham to sleep with Hagar, even though she laughed at the promises of God, God still kept his promise. By his grace, he gave Sarah a son. And God will keep his promises with us, even when we make mistakes. If we maintain our faith in Jesus Christ, he will maintain his promises to us. If you're a Christian, God has given you great and precious promises. And in Christ, we have the promise of salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, a home forever in heaven. In Christ, we have the promise of a new resurrected body, eternal, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible, a body that will never suffer from the problems of sin and sickness, disease and suffering, a a body that will never suffer the fear of death. In Christ, we have the promise of a good, restored relationship with God. God is our heavenly father. And the Holy Spirit living within us, helping us to grow in our faith and become more like Jesus. The promises of God are powerful, life-changing promises. But only if we listen to them and believe in them. Look at what Peter tells us about these promises in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by by evil desires. That's what these promises can do for us. Are you listening to the promises of God? How should we respond to Genesis chapter 21? We need to trust in God's timing. And this is a lesson we've heard before in the life of Abraham. I mean, Abraham was 75 years old when he first got the promise from God. And so we see that throughout his journey in life, Abraham is constantly being tested with this principle. Are you going to trust in the timing of God? And we see that lesson taught here again in Genesis chapter 21. Look at verse 2. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Twice in Genesis 18. God gave specific details about the timing of this promise. He said, in one year, Sarah will have a son. And this verse in chapter 21, verse 2, is the fulfillment of that promise, the specific timing of God. At that very time, God fulfilled his promise. However, God rarely reveals the details of his timing to us. This was an exception to the rule. And and even in the life of Abraham, when Abraham first got this promise, it was back in chapter 12, 25 years earlier, when God said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And at that time, God didn't say anything about when the promise would be fulfilled. And God repeated that promise several times throughout Abraham's journey of faith. In chapter 13, in chapter 15, and in chapter 17, God repeats this promise. But in none of those occasions did God ever tell Abraham or Sarah the details of his timing when that promise would be fulfilled. It was not until... A year before the birth of Isaac, that God revealed when the promise would be fulfilled. So for 24 years, Abraham and Sarah just had to trust in God's timing, not knowing when it would be fulfilled. And that was not easy. But that's what God calls us to do as well. 
We live in a sin-cursed world with all kinds of problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, and we have trouble. Most of us have experienced it several times over this past year. We have all kinds of problems. We have health problems, financial problems. We have emotional problems. We have physical problems and spiritual problems. We have social and relational problems. We have all kinds of problems in this sin-cursed world. But Jesus also said, take heart. I have overcome this world. And in Christ, we know that this is a promise we have from Jesus, that he has overcome all the problems of this world. Jesus does not promise to take away all of our problems in this life, but he promises to be with us and to help us overcome the struggles we face in this world. Now, we usually can't see exactly how and when that promise will be fulfilled. But if we are patient, if we trust in God's timing, if we wait upon the Lord, He will help us through all the problems that we face in this world. That's what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 through 31. He says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Are you trusting in the timing of God? Are you waiting upon the Lord? Believing that, yes, He will help us through these difficult times. He will help us through the problems of this world. We might not know all the details of the how and the when, but we can trust His timing. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 21? We need to obey God's commands. Abraham was a man of faith. And his faith was demonstrated in his obedience to God. Look at verses 3 and 4. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, Sarah, who bore, uh, the, his son who Sarah bore to him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. We actually see Abraham obeying God in two ways in this passage, both of which relate back to commands that God gave to Abraham in chapter 17. In chapter 17, God sealed the covenant with Abraham through the practice of circumcision and God told Abraham that every male born in his family, born in his whole camp, must be circumcised on the eighth day. And so Abraham obeys that command here in this passage. Also in chapter 17, God told Abraham that he and Sarah would have a son. And like Sarah, who later in chapter 18 would laugh, so also Abraham laughed at the idea. What? What? Sarah is going to have a son? Abraham was still hoping that Ishmael would be the, the son through whom God would fulfill his promise. God said, no, that was not my plan. Sarah will have a son. And in response to Abraham's laughter, God gave the command to Abraham, you're going to name that son Isaac. Because Isaac means he laughs. And they did. Uh, they laughed. And Abraham named his son Isaac. He laughs. And every time Abraham or Sarah would call their son, they would be reminded of how God made them laugh with a promise that seemed to be impossible. And how God brought laughter into their lives by fulfilling that promise. Abraham and Sarah chose to believe and obey God. But it wasn't always easy. Sometimes they failed. Sometimes they made mistakes. But God was always faithful. God was right there. He, Whenever they fell down, he picked them up and he put them back on their feet spiritually. He corrected them 
and you led them and guided them. And the same is true for us. If we put our faith in Christ, God will be faithful to us. And when we fall down, when we make mistakes, He will be there to correct us, to pick us up, to put us back on our feet. In difficult times, obeying God will be a challenge to our faith. But if we remember just how much God loves us and how much He's already done for us, we'll have the faith to obey God. John puts it this way in 1 John 5, verses 3 through 4. This is love for God, to obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Our faith, as we remember how much God loves us, that strengthens our faith. And, and if you have put your faith in Christ, if you've been baptized into Christ, you have been born of God. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and He helps you. He helps you to grow and develop in your faith. He helps you to obey the commands of God. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 21? We need to rejoice in God's grace. Look at what Sarah says in verses 6 and 7. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. Sarah knows that the fulfillment of this seemingly impossible promise was by the mighty power of God and by His amazing grace. She can't help but laugh and rejoice in God's grace. And she invites everyone who hears about this to laugh with her, rejoice with me, celebrate with me. But she wasn't always celebrating. She wasn't always laughing. Sarah had gone through some difficult times. And even after this blessing, she will continue to have struggles in life. On two different occasions before this event, she was taken away from her husband against her will and put into the harem of a king. One of those times was just in the previous chapter with Abimelech. She had been through difficult times in her life. And Sarah knew the heartache of living with, with grief and shame and reproach and feelings of guilt. In that culture, to be barren was a reproach. A woman who was a wife, unable to bear children was looked down upon in that society. She was seen as someone under a curse, someone being punished by the gods. That's not what the Bible teaches, but that's the way society looked at Sarah and other women who were barren. And it was during this time of shame and hopelessness that Sarah desperately came up with this plan for Abraham to sleep with Hagar and have a child that way. Of course, that was not God's plan. Sarah's shortcut caused all kinds of problems that would continue on in her life, even after Isaac was born. But God's amazing grace continues to correct Sarah's mistakes and continues to bring blessings of, of forgiveness and healing into her life. And that's how God's amazing grace works in our lives through Jesus Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, He took all of our sin and all of our shame upon Himself so that we could have eternal life in heaven and be free from all our sin and shame. Paul says that He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about the salvation we have through Jesus and the inheritance waiting for us in heaven. And he says this, In this you greatly rejoice, 
though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. God's amazing grace should cause us to rejoice greatly. It should cause us to celebrate, even when we're going through difficult times, all kinds of problems. Through Jesus, God has removed our sin and all of our shame. He's given us forgiveness and freedom from sins. Our old life is gone. We have a new life in Christ. As we go through the difficulties of 2020 and now 2021, all the problems of this world, let's focus on God's grace. Let's rejoice in the blessings that God has given to us through Jesus. Let's rejoice greatly. Like Sarah rejoiced in God's grace, let's invite others to rejoice with us. Are you rejoicing in God's grace today? Has God brought laughter into your life? We're going to pray and sing one more song. And as we do that, let's rejoice in God's grace. And let's think about this passage here in Genesis 21 and and how God wants us to respond to his word this week. Let's listen to the promises of God. Let's trust in God's timing. Let's obey his commands, and let's rejoice in his grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the blessings we have in Christ. Thank you for bringing laughter into our lives and and a reason to rejoice and celebrate. And God, I pray as we meditate on this passage that it would continue to speak to us and that your Holy Spirit would help us to see how you want us to respond to your word. God, I pray that we would listen to your promises and believe in them, and that we would trust in your timing and obey your commands. But most of all, God, I just pray you'd help us to rejoice in your grace. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley 
there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.